Are there signs of evolution in your body? Millions have watched this video that claims that some of our arm and ear muscles, as well as goosebumps and our tailbones, are leftovers from our supposed evolutionary past. Let's find out if this is true. But first, let's see the big picture. In the 1890s, so called vestigial organs numbered as high as 180. Now, modern science is actually down to zero. The most recent so called vestigial organs to make the we actually need these list are the tonsils, the appendix, and the pineal gland. We've learned that the tonsils and appendix help fight off infection. The pineal gland is critical for biorhythms and sleep. What about the palmaris longus? Is it a vestigial part of our bodies? A long slender muscle in some of our forearms that's left over from the evolutionary process? While most of us have it, between 2% and 64% of various people groups around the world do not. But this is no different than the prevalence of wisdom teeth, having three, four, or five vertebrae fused in our tailbones, or many other subtle differences we see in humans. Whether we have this muscle or not makes very little impact in our lives. Some studies show it improves pinch strength, but others say it doesn't. We see variable traits in all species. What's going on here is no different than the variability we see in the animal world. For example, finches, lizards, or mice. One recent study tracked over 1,000 finch beaks. It showed that finches have epigenetic mechanisms that change their beaks within even one generation. Rather than proving evolution, as Darwin tried to do with this very species, the latest science actually reveals that these adaptive mechanisms come built in. This fits the creation model's concept of a supernatural programmer who equipped creatures to track and adapt to their environments as they fill the earth. We see the same thing with anolis lizards, which rapidly change the length of their legs within one generation based on the type of vegetation they've adapted to. Similarly, the same species of field mice deployed short tails when they live in the prairies, or long tails with additional vertebrae if they live in forested habitats. The longer tails of forest-dwelling mice is the result of non-random innate biomechanical sensors that respond to forested environments where longer tails are beneficial. This precise and purposeful bone length and number adjustments point to intentional design. So, the variability we see between people and sometimes people groups, such as having a palmaris longus or not, has nothing to do with evolution. It simply shows variability that was pre-engineered into our genes passed down from Adam, the very first human. Are our ear muscles vestigial? This video claims that we have three ear muscles that are leftovers from evolution and that our ears make a futile effort to pick up sounds from different directions. However, these muscles have structural purposes, not directional. During our development in the womb, these muscles affect the shaping of the ear. When they don't develop properly, all sorts of abnormalities emerge that can require surgery. These helpful muscles anchor the ears during development, support blood circulation to the side of our heads, protect the underlying structures, and stabilize the outer ear in its proper location. So. While our ear muscles were not intended to move to better capture sound, they serve other purposes as though they were designed. In fact, aren't we missing something here? Like the amazing design of the ear itself? Our sophisticated hearing system is made up of five separate components that don't make any sense by themselves, but when combined together, they make a complete system that allows us to hear. It all starts with the outer ear, which is specially shaped to capture sound waves so they can travel through the ear canal. These sound waves press against our eardrums and wiggle three tiny bones, called the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, that amplify the signal by a factor of 1.7 times using leverage. This mechanical process converts to a hydraulic process by pressing against the cochlea, which again amplifies the signal, this time by a factor of 22 times. The fluid inside the cochlea moves over 20,000 microscopic hair cells that are connected by tiny molecular linking springs causing an electromechanical transduction process that transforms the sound vibration into a neural signal that is immediately comprehended as speech. Just how did evolution dream all of this up? These five separate systems, each of which is purposeless and meaningless without the others, all connecting to make an overall hearing system that truly shows intentional design. Without the cranial hearing nerve, what good are thousands of multi-length hair cells that interpret various sound frequencies? If the hair cells were not bathed in a solution with the perfect ratio of potassium and calcium, how could they transfer the sound signal? What purpose would the cochlea serve without the three tiny ear bones that amplify the signal just enough for the whole thing to work? 
And did you know there's even a tiny tendon between the hammer and anvil that shifts the stirrup backward to protect the ear when sounds are too loud? How did chance evolution think that one up? Our hearing system is even self-lubricated with drainage tubes. And to think, this entire system runs on energy from what we ate for breakfast. Our hearing system has been carefully engineered to take invisible sound waves through a complex system that turns them into electrical signals that are heard as sound and immediately comprehended as speech. What's amazing is that we even do this in stereo. Having ears on both sides of our head enables us to determine the direction and distance of sounds almost immediately. Our brain even tracks how long it takes for sound to travel from one ear to the other to determine speed. How amazing is that? Our hearing system even does all of this while keeping our balance along the pitch, roll, and yaw axis. Realistically speaking, how could something like this evolve? Doesn't the design explanation make more sense? How could such an interconnected, interdependent, complex hearing system arise by mere chance with no intentional design? Even the starting systems in cars, which also have five components, are obviously put together by a designer to serve an overall purpose that is only evident when they are all put together in a certain way. Indeed, the five components of our hearing system were put together at the same time when we were made as complete, functioning humans who are well equipped for taking dominion over this planet God gave us. Some random hodgepodge of matter plus energy and time has never produced something with such function, purpose, and cohesiveness, with all of the independent parts requiring the other to make anything of use or value. Are goosebumps useless vestigial parts in humans today? Were they only beneficial for our furry mammal relatives because they raise hair and increase the amount of space for insulation? This video calls them another futile effort by our vestigial body parts. Actually, they're not. New research has confirmed both purpose and function for goosebumps, stating, For us, naked apes, goosebumps are often thought of as a kind of evolutionary hangover, and people used to think the goosebump muscle was vestigial, an evolutionary remnant of no functional significance. Now, their 3D constructions have uncovered this muscle to be a lot more interesting than we thought. The erector pili helps maintain vital stem cells of the skin. Their report continues, The lower end of the goosebump muscle is attached to the follicle so it creates a stem cell niche, a place that protects and maintains stem cell populations. The upper end of the goosebump muscle creates a second stem cell niche, which is even more important in that it maintains the stem cell population for the entire outer layer of the skin. The muscle is like a dumbbell connecting the two vital stem cell niches. He continues, Until we did this research, no one knew where the stem cells were in the epidermis. The stem cell population are very important in wound healing and skin cancer. From a practical standpoint, goosebumps help keep us warm by generating heat and trapping a layer of air when we're cold. Also, a team of Harvard researchers found that they may trigger new hair growth. They said, goosebumps are part of a two-phased response to cold. In the first, the muscle below the skin is stimulated to form goosebumps. If this stimulation lasts long enough, the second phase kicks in, with the sympathetic nervous system calling for new hair growth and repairs for the old ones to be made in response to the cold. What an appropriate design. A mechanism to generate heat when goosebump muscles contract, coupled with shivering to stay warm when we're cold, and a trigger for generating more hair if the cold keeps up. And let's not forget the emotional benefits connected with goosebumps, like when we are touched physically or psychologically. As always, even this body part plays multiple roles, are our tailbones vestigial? This video claims our tailbones are what's left of our ancestors' tails. Well, did you know that the baby shown in the video with the supposed leftover tail had nothing of the sort? This baby actually had spina bifida, a condition where the backbone does not form normally and a sack of spinal fluid comes through an opening in the baby's back. Far from being a tail, this is an abnormality, an outgrowth of the spinal cord, which is covered by skin as the body's way of protecting the bulging area. The actual reason for this baby's so-called tail was grayed out in their video. How desperate for evidence of vestigial organs must one be to resort to malformations for confirmation? Let's look at it this way. If our tailbones are truly just leftovers from the evolutionary process, why not just take them out whenever they cause trouble, like they used to do 30 years ago with tonsils when they considered them vestigial? The answer is because they serve so many functions. That's why surgically removing the tailbone is regarded as a last resort by medical experts. 
After treating hundreds of patients with tailbone issues over the last 20 years, Dr. Shakib has this to say about tailbone removal. You have to understand, despite what people say or the, the whole mindset of, oh, your tailbone, you don't need it. This is part of uh, evolution and it was a tail. That I, forget about that part. It actually plays a role in providing an anchor to a lot of ligaments and it provides support for a lot of structures in your pelvic floor, pelvic wall, the integrity of your whole pelvis. It's not there just to hang out there. It's not there because, you know, it was like extra body part, what are we gonna call it? Call it coccyx and put it in the pelvis situation. It actually has a function. So it's like a, like a tent. So you put a bar right here to have a, an apex for a tent, to build a tent, tent around. Look at it like that. While you're under that tent, without that tip, the tent's gonna fall. So this coccyx or tailbone actually provides quite a bit of structural uh, integrity support for the muscles, ligaments, tendons and connective tissues there. So if you're told, oh, your tailbone doesn't seem to go away, let's remove it, you're more than likely trading one problem to a set of a bunch of other problems. The tailbone has many functions. First, it's the terminal point of our spinal column. It's gotta end somewhere, right? And rather than just ending with a regular vertebrae, our curved tailbones provide flexible cupped support for our pelvic floor. Next, key muscle groups connect to the tailbone. They support the surrounding structures, help with delivering babies, sexual pleasure, and both bathroom functions. Support ligaments and the ganglion impar nerve also merge at the tailbone. The tailbone is also designed to bear weight when we sit, just like one leg of a tripod. When we're seated and lean back, the weight load is shifted almost entirely to the tailbone. Our tailbones are so significant that the medical community holds tailbone symposia and entire books are published on tailbone treatments. Finally, let's hear from pelvic floor specialist, clinician Hina Sheth about how people can recover from tailbone removal surgery. Removing the coccyx bones, even part of the sacrum, can actually have an effect on the rest of your body and I wanna to talk to you why. This is where your spine would attach and then this is your sacrum and then there is your tailbone right over here. There's a lot of muscular attachments to the tailbone as well as to the sacrum. And this muscular attachment, part of it is the pelvic floor, okay? Which is a hammock type muscle that basically starts at your pubic bone and then it circles around and it hooks onto your tailbone, okay? And there's lots of muscles in this area, 16 plus muscles of your pelvic floor. Most people think of a pelvic floor is one muscle, but it's actually several different muscles and they have different attachments to many different areas. One of those being the tailbone as well as part of the sacrum. And if these muscles were attached here, okay, and you had this bone or part of this bone in the sacrum removed, then what happened to the muscles that were attached to that area? Chances are they may have not even done anything. And so what ends up happening is these muscles can become dysfunctional and the rest of the muscles have to if these muscles aren't working correctly anymore because they were either resected or cut off okay then the rest of your muscles are probably going to compensate or overwork potentially to make up for the fact that these guys are no longer working anymore and if these muscles get super super tight okay because they're overworking or and then it can affect everything from sexual function to emptying your bladder to emptying your your rectum okay so that's going to interfere with constipation and it can interfere with intercourse and it can interfere with emptying your bladder um, and it can cause everything from urinary frequency meaning you feel like you have to go all the time it might even give you burning with urination it can give you pain with having a bowel movement or again related to constipation because now you can't sufficiently relax these muscles for the stool to come out but the other thing is is it can also create a lot of hip pain and the reason why is because a lot of this musculature okay one and two, or two muscles in particular are called the piriformis and the obturator internus 
actually hook on to the hip. And it could also cause low back pain because part of the role of these muscles in the pelvic floor is to actually help to stabilize the pelvis as well as the spine. For So for some of you who might be having sacroiliac joint pain, which is this joint right over here, this sacrum attaches to a pelvic bone and this is called your sacroiliac joint. So if you have pain in that low back um, or even pain in your lumbar spine or even changes in your lumbar spine, this could be something that has developed over time because of the change due to the removal of the coccyx or the sacrum. As always, even this body part plays multiple roles. What's going on here? Body part by body part, we're finding out that our creator designed humans from the outset as complete beings with multifunctional and whole interconnected systems with no leftover parts. Just look at our circulatory, respiratory, nervous, digestive, and skeletal systems. No people group on earth is without these systems, and they're not evolving over time. The evidence of fully functional design fits the concepts that all our systems were installed complete from the beginning. While the basic components of these systems don't need to change much, God designed some parts of our bodies to continuously adapt to our environments, turning on or off, or dialing up or down gene expressions. These shifts help each generation to accommodate for changing conditions like diet, climate, and sunlight as we express creative variations on the human theme. These changes can occur quickly over just one or two generations, such as fat retention. Other changes can occur over several generations. Whether fast or slow, changes like muscle configurations such as the palmaris longus, wisdom teeth, body shapes and sizes, hair, and others only reflect the truth that God engineered variability within us so we could effectively multiply and spread across the earth as He commanded. Have you ever considered that while humans change and adapt over time, all the fundamental systems of people groups around the world are both identical and complete? Consider any healthy hearing system. Each comes complete with mechanical, hydraulic, electrochemical, and signal processing systems all perfectly assembled and integrated to capture sound and interpret speech all in real time. Can random chance really design, build, and assemble precision-engineered instruments like hearing? Consider the intricate design of our two eyes. Each of our two eyes have millions of working parts, clean themselves 20 times per minute, have 107 million light-sensitive cells capable of seeing a candle 1.7 miles away, and can distinguish 10 million colors using 576 megapixel photosensors, about 50 times more than our smartphones. All people groups around the world have this complete system, and no groups are still in the process of evolving them. Our human design may even be more incredible than you previously imagined. Did you know that our eyes are connected to our ears to form a complete navigational system? Try this experiment. Extend your thumb in front of you and fix your gaze on your thumbnail. Then move your head left to right, then up and down. Then try it again moving your head even faster in all directions. Do you think your eyes moved when you did this or just your head? Actually, both your eyes and your head moved. That's because your eyes and ears are connected with a motion-sensing system called the vestibulo-ocular reflex. This gaze-stabilizing reflex transforms your head movements into motor commands that generate compensatory eye movements in the opposite direction of your head to ensure stable vision. This built-in image stabilizer system coordinates our sight, complete with two eyes with 12 directional muscles, with our hearing system that includes two ears with semicircular canals that contain motion-sensing fibers each complete with microscopic springs that open and close biochemical gates to create polarization waves that travel along three nerves so our eyes and head are perfectly coordinated to turn in opposite directions simultaneously. And let's not forget that this entire system depends on the constant gravity of this planet and no other. Perhaps this coordinated dual apparatus system is why God says in Proverbs, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Where are the human groups with evolving versions of this or any other system? We all share this same system. How could time, death, and chance assemble our hearing system with five independent machines that work on four different platforms yet interface with our two eyes and all their complexities? Only by turning a blind eye to such intelligent, intentional, efficient, synchronized, and correlated systems can we deceive ourselves into thinking that our bodies came from evolution's endless airs. We are better by acknowledging our Creator for designing such amazing systems. In closing, we would like to share why we make these videos. For those who are already Christians, we hope these videos strengthen your faith.
It's important that Christians know they can trust God's Word all the way back to the beginning, especially in a world saturated with evolution teaching. To those being drawn to faith in Christ, trusting in God's Word is part of that process. Even though you might not fully believe in these things now, we pray you will grow in trust and understanding that God's Word is both scientifically and historically credible, all the way back to the beginning. Your faith journey begins with repentance and turning away from your sins, realizing that Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. In the words of Jesus, Most assuredly, I say to you, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. We encourage you to take this first step to a new life. Looking for answers about what the Bible teaches about creation, the fossil record, dinosaurs? Download the Genesis Apologetics app from the iTunes or Google Play stores for answers to these questions and more.